Some of you are too young to remember Palm Pilots. But you sure know how to write notes on your phone. In fact, I know now the best way to take notes in a class is to wait for the teacher to write them on the board and then to take a picture of them. If you didn't know that, that's what they're doing these days. And it's so cool because you don't get writer's cramp anymore. But I still write things on pieces of paper and I know that there are three things that I wanted you to know today. First of all, I wanted to thank all those who have participated in this particular time and so thankful that the Rodriguez family brought their son into it as well. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, there is a lady in this church who has been to Israel probably more times than many people and she wants to know if there are any other people who are interested in planning another trip to Israel. Some call it the Holy Land. I just call it Israel. Um, there are some associations with that land with God, but you would be surprised how many people in that land who may have a heritage that you would think would give them the right to call themselves the people of God don't even believe in God. So it's very interesting to go to Israel and you need to know that if you go, you must go for your own reasons. Uh, there are many people who think they should go to Israel so that they can change people who are there. Those people just laugh at them. So this is a trip that would be for us and those who would want to go. You've already heard of, about VBS. It is one of the biggest things this congregation does that is known in the community and is cooperative with the other eight churches that will be doing this particular program. It's fun. We saw probably 150 kids at the VBS at the United Methodist Church. They were having fun, including a slippy slide. So we may just do that here too. The other thing is there's a few weeks left, not counting next week, because of course we don't want you to go next week unless you really have to, of summer camp. Okay? Um, I talked to several people about it uh, two weeks ago, and I'm still interested. If you know... Uh, I actually have had someone come up to me and say, look, um, I'm ready. I think summer camp is amazing. I, I, I'm ready to pay for two kids to go to summer camp. If we can please do that, it would make my little heart sing, you know, because I love summer camp. And I used to make summer camp happen for the Ohio Conference. I know the effect that it can have on a young life, uh, especially... Uh, lives that are maybe spread out with different parts of family, lives that don't necessarily get to come to church a lot. You know, I especially love it when a church family says, you know what, you could do with a week of summer camp. Why don't you go? We'll pay for it. So I think we're prepared to do that as a congregation for someone who would like to go to summer camp. So I've done my list. I've done my list. I hope you make lists uh, because I know that if I don't make lists, sometimes I forget. And that's what I told Erica last week because I was supposed to ask you about Israel last week and I didn't. So I have done it, Peter. I've done it this week. I'm asking you, there's not many of you here this, this particular Sabbath and that's okay. I do know that there are those who, when they don't come, uh, watch the video afterwards. And I, I'm thankful for that. And if you would like to share that with your friends it means that what we do here on Sabbath is expanded and its reach is expanded and more people are blessed. So just let them know that they can do that and it's, it's pretty easy. To the scripture then. Last week we, we grabbed a hold of a whole, a whole piece of the Old Testament. Okay, And I just want to remind you that the Old Testament is, is broken into three pieces. Okay, And the first piece is what many call the books of Moses, okay? Uh, some, some are questioning whether Moses wrote all of them. Doesn't matter, I know them as the book of, books of Moses and that's what I'm going with currently. They are known as the Pentateuch because there are five of them, Penta is five. So five books of Moses. And we only had time, of course, last week to talk about one, one story. And so what we're looking for in the Old Testament in these three weeks, in these first three weeks of July is really to answer the question, is there the good news? 
that God wanted people to know on earth. Is that good news available for us in the Old Testament? And I think that we, we found last week that in the story of the snake on the pole, which, you know, is, it, it's, it's nice when you can have a little catchphrase that goes with it, where if you've been bitten by the snake, that old serpent, okay, you can look and live. Now, the bonus passage that I didn't mention last week, time runs out very quickly in these places, was the fact that there is a text that says, see if you can finish it for me, cursed is he who is hung on a tree. Just let that percolate for a moment. Here you have Moses, he's in the desert, and he puts a snake, the one who is cursed because of his role in rebellion against God, he is put on a pole, he is put on a tree. But does this not make you think about the cross? Hold on to that, hold on to that, because you see, that is the focal point of the good news, that Jesus takes our punishment for us. Hold on to that, because we're going to another section today. We're going to a, a, a big section, actually, and I, I could have chosen one of the major books, Isaiah, or Isaiah, or Ezekiel. These are known as the major prophets. Why? Because I guess their books were bigger, and they said a lot more. But then you have what are called the minor prophets or the little prophets. But I'm going to tell you, just as small snakes, isn't this what they tell us here in California about baby rattlesnakes? Their bite can be and sometimes is more deadly than a big snake. So don't discount what comes from a minor so-called minor prophet. We're going to look at that whole group right now, and of course we only have time for one story. So the story comes out of Zephaniah, okay? And he starts, he starts with a bang. He starts with uh, the, the apocalypse, okay? That's, that's the word that, that many of us know because of movies and, and, and just because uh, maybe you speak Spanish as your, your native tongue, and, and because of that, you know that the last book of the Bible is called the Apocalypse of John. Now, us English speakers, we call it the Revelation. But in Spanish, it's, it's the Apocalypse. It's, it's, it's the end piece. Zephaniah wants you to know that his word from the Lord is going to be situated in that context. It's going to be about the end, and he, as, as scholars believe, and, and, and I certainly have studied, and, and I believe as well, that when scholars talk like this, excuse me, when prophets talk like this, the great day of the Lord, that in fact the vision that God has given them is the vision of the final not, not something specific to Israel, but he's, he's given this vision that many of the prophets have been given that is the final, final vision of the world being, what do we read in, in, in Zephaniah? If you want to turn there in the Bible in front of you or on your phone, he, he is talking about sweeping away. He's talking about fire. He's talking about the apocalypse. That's the context, that's the context of, of what he is talking about. G God, God says uh, through, through Zephaniah, I will sweep away. He uses big phrases like this, I will sweep away, I will cut off that, that machete that was up here, which is probably one of the two main tools of the, de well, developing world. The other one I have in my shed too is a hoe. It's, it's a big, thick, matic hoe. If you go to Egypt, if you go to many parts of the world, this is what they dig their, 
water canals with. This is how they irrigate their crops. If you don't have a hoe and a machete, you don't have the tools for farming. But the phrase that is used, the phrase that is used by many prophets, including Zephaniah, is, I will cut off. This is, this is a phrase you hear about in, in Exodus. If, if so-and-so does this and this, they will be cut off from their people. This is violent language. I, I, I have a friend, she's called Amy, and, and, and she's not yet ready for her son to play with knives. I don't know, maybe you have different policies in your house. My mother had a different policy. I grew up uh, near the Vietnam War, and she did not want me to ever play with guns so that I could say, I have not played with guns, I shouldn't bear arms if I'm ever called up into the military. She was very worried about this. She's an immigrant person, and she didn't know how America works, and so she didn't want me to play with guns. But she didn't mind if I had a pocket knife or an axe. Yeah, she bought me a small axe. Parents are cautious with their children these days. I think that's good. I think that's good. Then they don't usually have as many problems. God uses this violent type language. He says, I'll take a, so a, a sword. Have you ever heard of a sword in the Bible? Right there in Genesis, there's a flaming sword that guards the entrance of the garden. I will cut off people from the land. In verse 4, uh, we ident the, the identity of the rebellious and the idolatrous. Okay, so we've got some big language going on here is what I want you to catch a hold of. And this, this connects to what we have talked about last week. The snake on the pole, the gospel, the good news, look and live. Now we are given another situation in which the whole world is in view and there is rebellious people, people who have rebelled against God and they have also become idolatrous people. In the very first chapter there in Zephaniah, he mentions the name of a particular God. It begins with M. I don't know if you're looking at it, but it's actually, uh, when I see this name, I want you to know that there are movies that do depict some of this, and I don't you know, want you to necessarily watch movies that will sear your mind forever and ever, but Moloch was the god that would have images made in which fires were lit, and on whose semi-molten arms children would be offered up. This is the people to whom Zephaniah is talking. These are the rebellious. These are the idolatrous. They have traded in. They have traded in their relationship with God to have a relationship with a flesh-eating God. It's, it, it, it boggles my mind. But then, as we will see, this particular prophet speaks to our day as well. So please don't think, oh, those terrible Israelites, how could they forsake God? How could they be rebellious? How could they be idolatrous? Please hold on to those feelings. Maybe remember that as you point fingers, there will be some fingers pointing back at us. Those who turn back from following the Lord, neither they neither seek the Lord, nor do they even ask Him about anything. In other words, they have severed their relationship. This is who Zephaniah is talking to, and he says, Beware, because the great day of the Lord is near. So this, this theme of the great day of the Lord, something that I wrote about, or was asked to write about when I was studying in school, becomes this context in which we're talking. And as I, I'm going to say again, I do believe that when these prophets were shown this particular vision, each and every one of them saw the same vision, and they saw the great and terrible day of the Lord. They saw the conflagration of the world, for which Christians today, Bible-believing Christians such as yourselves, are actually called dangerous people by people like Richard Dawkins. Raise your hand if you know Richard Dawkins. 
Richard Dawkins is an avid evolutionist who likes to take pastors apart. He likes to take Christians apart and point fingers at them and make fun and show the, how their logic doesn't work. And then he will say, if you believe in an apocalypse, if you believe in a fiery end to this world, and you're actually looking forward to it, are you listening to me, Adventist? Are you listening? You are a dangerous person. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that there could be somebody here on this earth who would think that your idea of how the world will end if you're believing the Bible could actually be thought of as dangerous to humanity. I didn't, I, I didn't really think that until he brought it up. But it actually does make sense. If I don't believe that the world is going to end, that it's just going to get better and better, and that we're going to work out our own problems, and that generation after generation, we're going to just continue on as humanity in this particular world, uh, doing whatever we do according to evolution, which is what? Survival of the fittest. Meaning, if you die of starvation in Africa, sucks for you, you grew up in Africa instead of America. That's the, that, that's the attitude of evolution, isn't it? If you happen to be part of the weaker part of humanity, so sad for you. Okay? And then if you go one step further and say, this world is going to end, and God, God is going to send seven plagues upon this world, and this prophet, along with the other prophets, sees that happen in vision, the great and terrible day of the Lord. You're a dangerous person. You actually want this world to end like that? I mean, that's really talking about global warming, isn't it? Fire, destruction. Chris and I, as you know, like to watch cheesy disaster movies. And they did make a movie about 2012. Okay, it's a funny family movie in some respects, but yet it's not so funny because it does have a great and terrible earthquake in it. And yes, L.A. tips up the tectonic plate moves and L.A. slides off into the sea. Yeah, the San Andreas Fault is real. It's where one huge tectonic plate rubs up against another and every earthquake that L.A. has ever had has been that one plate shifting maybe two to three feet more than it usually does. Maybe it moves just an inch or two a year and we get little vibrations once in a while. But every time there's a big shift in Nepal, for example, the subcontinent of India is crashing up against the Eurasian subcontinent and it slips about three feet every year. So yes, there are going to be earthquakes in Nepal. This is just a fact of life. There are going to, because the plates, but what if those plates go the other way? So some movie directors said, let's make a movie about those plates going the other way because there's an earthquake somewhere else in the world and the plates start moving. So it is pretty, pretty amazing to be up in the Himalayas in that movie and watching water come over the top of the Himalayas. It's a great movie if you understand humanism. You understand that that's the greatest religion in the world today, that we can save ourselves. This book, Zephaniah, is written to those people. Those people who feel that the apocalypse and people who believe in the apocalypse are dangerous people. The movie 2012 has some pretty crazy people in it, but people who believe that something is going to happen and we need to save ourselves. You know what? Spoiler alert, they can't think of anything better to save humanity in than what's already been done in the Bible by God with Noah. Yes. They save humanity on three big, huge arcs. They couldn't think of anything better. I guess SpaceX is trying to say we should depopulate the world and go live on Mars. The apocalypse is coming as far as Elon Musk is concerned. He says, let's just zoom off into space and go to another planet to live. I don't know. Is he a prophet? 
Is he like Zephaniah? Can he, ha, has he seen a vision of the apocalypse? And is he basically like every other humanist before him saying, we need to save ourselves? But here's the good news. Zephaniah doesn't leave the picture there. He makes statements like, God is going to come and he is going to gather up those who still believe in him and he is going to bring them back home. He is going to fight for them. He is going to take their punishment for them. And he is going to give them a home. This is how Zephaniah ends. It's good news indeed. I believe there is hope, there is protection, there is restoration, and there is mercy and grace. Some people say, oh, we should be preaching grace. And then they say, and then I say, well, have you, have you found grace in the Old Testament? I want you to go away from today saying, my pastor says, or I read myself, that would be better to say, I read myself that there is grace in the Old Testament. There is grace in the book of Zephaniah. What is grace? As opposed to mercy. Anyone hazard a one-sentence guess? Okay, grace is unmerited favor. Okay, so that was probably a great way to say it in the 1900s. Because that's the way I grew up. Unmerited favor. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Got it? So then what's mercy? Not getting what you do deserve. Do you see why I always ask my dad for mercy when he was about to give me a little talking to my backside? I often knew that I deserved it, but I was pleading for mercy. Three instead of six. Yes, you would think that my dad was a, 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 a beast, but he was a, a person of his age and grew up in his country where Corporal punishment was the way to train up a child. Sparing the rod was not an option. Yep. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. There's grace here in Zephaniah. These are rebellious people. These, these are idolatrous people. They have traded in a relationship with a life-giving God to, a, to, to, to serve in a, a cultic relationship with a life-taking God. Do they deserve? No. They don't deserve God's protection. They don't deserve his affection. They don't deserve. But here it is in Zephaniah. He says, but I will give it to you anyway. What has is, what is been really good for me, I will tell you, in this study this week, has been to realize that I am not the judge. I'm not the one who gets to determine even about my own salvation. I'm not going to be the one to determine your salvation. God is going to determine that. And he is going to do it because he is just and he is fair and he is gracious. He gives you what you don't deserve, and he is also merciful. He doesn't give you what you do deserve. Wow, wow. It, it, I don't know about you, but this is really good news. Okay? It, it's, it's, for me, it's definitely good news worth sharing with people in this community who may have a really warped idea about God. God caused me this, and God did this to me, and God hurt me, and, and how can God let that happen? Have you heard these phrases? Maybe you have even uttered them yourself. 
I say that those are phrases from people for whom God is the great vending machine in the sky. And indeed, he is to a certain extent, because as I've said several times already in the last few weeks, he sent the sun today, folks. He did not withhold the sunshine from us. The Bible says he sends it on those who deserve it and those who don't. Those who love him and those who don't. He sends the sun and he sends the rain. He gives us oxygen. We have life today, folks, regardless of how we feel about God. So I've got to remember that about my friends in Santa Clarita, in all of L.A., the good, the bad, and the ugly. They have life today because the life giver gave them life. And in fact, he would love to give them eternal life. Good for them, good for me. I don't get to be the judge as to who lives forever. He does. And in Zephaniah, he's reminding us that when it all comes down, when the apocalypse happens, he is going to be the one who will determine who the remnant is. And it's going to be quite simple. It will, it will boil down to those who want to be with God. Those who want to say yes to him. That, that's, that's as simple as I can make it. Those who, want, those who have been influenced and have accepted the influence of the Holy Spirit in their life. We were talking last night, and, and uh, Edgar and I have a friend. He is an example of people who may not know the God by the names that we give him, but by the way that he acts, it's very obvious God is working in his life. And in fact, get this, God is helping other people through the life of a man who doesn't even believe in him. Now, rap, church people, got to wrap your mind around that. And here's how I know that God does this and that he's been doing it for generations because he called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. This is a pagan king, yet he is called by God, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. So you see why I'm really glad that I'm not the judge? Because there are some people out there that, from my perspective, they, they, they're quite useless to the kingdom of God. And then I realize that there are times when I'm probably quite useless to the kingdom of God too. Because I too am convicted by Zephaniah as having traded in that relationship for a relationship of my own making with the idols that abound in this world. And I know that the apocalypse is coming. And I still do it. So do you think this is do you think this is good news for me? This is great news for me that there is a God in heaven who will pull a remnant together, a people who really want to live with him, really want to be with him forever and uh, are, are, he's going to use them initially to go out and tell the rest of the world uh, that they can too be part of it because really God wants everybody as we have said so many times and so I want you to know that I see myself I see myself in this story and I hope you do too I see myself needing, needing to know that there are idols there are idols in my life that I need to put away that I need to say, I no longer am going to be concerned with you. I no longer am going to pay attention to you. And I'm going to box it up for you real nice and just say, Psalm 23 verse 4 says, Yea, though we walk through the valley of Santa Clarita, we will not pay attention. See, this is me. I'm saying it to myself. We will not pay attention to the evil empire. For thou 
thought with me. You are my shepherd. You are my leader. This is David. You know David. Yeah? Premeditated murder so that he could have a woman even though he had 15 others or more? Yeah, that David. Did God take his kingdom away from him? Did God throw him away? Did God excommunicate him from the church? No. My God came to him with his best friend and said, Dude, you stole that sheep from the guy who only had one when you had a whole flock. And David knew what he was talking about. I don't know what it is for you, but if God is grabbing a hold of you right now and saying, look, I want you back. I want you to be a part of my kingdom. I want you to go forward out into the world with this good news. Would you please help me? And, and it doesn't matter what happens in the future. I'm going to take care of you. In fact, this book is the one that gets me so excited because it's a picture of God singing. If you ever want to know that God sings, He sings. He is so excited about me and you being part of His family that He bursts out into song. He sings over us. He is so happy to have us in His family. I don't know about you, but that, that picture of God for me is way different. And it's one that I'd love to share with the person who says, Man, how could God love me? He gave me cancer. Or I've got this and this and this going on in my life. I don't even know if God loves me. I want you to go home today with the assurance your God loves you. He sings over you. He is, he is wanting to bless us and he's wanting to share this good, he's wanting us to share this good news with, with, with other people too. This is what the great day of the Lord is all about. It's about knowing, it's about knowing that there is mercy, there is grace, there is salvation, there is eternal life on the line. And God is wanting to ensure that we can be part of that. And so he says, look, I'll take your punishment for you. That's the deal. Do you realize that's what he did on the cross? People wear that cross, man. Gangsters. It's just jewelry to a lot of people. But that cross represents the curse, my friends, the curse under which we all have fallen and under which we all are guilty. That cross represents Jesus coming in and saying, I will take your punishment for you. No time, but the story is real quick. Little boy gets caught stealing a potato long time, one, long time ago, one room school. You know the story. How many, how many know the story? Good. Shh. There's a big boy in the school that has actually been bullying him. But when it's found that he was the one who stole the lunch, the, the rules had already been set up. You are going to get a, a, a caning in front of the whole school. And this, this guy is thin. He doesn't have but one coat and so he goes up front, he's trembling, and the teacher is there, and he's got his cane by his side, and he is about to start laying on the punishment on this young man when the big guy steps up. And lays himself across this little guy and tells the teacher, lay it on me. Teacher doesn't hold back. Just because it's a nice gift, teacher doesn't hold back. He lays into that guy and he winces and he doesn't cry, but he winces because he's taking the punishment for this guy who's hungry, who stole the big guy's lunch. I don't know, I don't know about you, 
But that's, that's a picture that has been seared into my mind, and it's the picture that Zephaniah wants you to know today. Jesus has taken your punishment for you. You can have life, and life eternal, if you just say yes. Thank you. I know that's hard. I know, I know it's real hard. Because you see, it's very hard for us to accept something for free. We always want to know. We always want to know, is it going to cost me? And, and, and yes, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you saying yes to Jesus. My friends, there's good news in the Old Testament. We found that there's good news now in the Pentateuch. And this story shows us that through Zephaniah that there's good news in the prophets. My plea to you, uh, if you would like to know more, is read, read the prophets. <coughs> um, if you have the stomach for it and uh, uh, would like to read something amazing, uh, there's the book of Hosea. It's uh, not easy reading. If you're a married person, a divorced person, or just a person in general, it's not easy reading. But God makes Hosea do things. God makes Zephaniah do things. God makes Haggai do things that definitely make me cringe and think to myself, oh my goodness, as a pastor, would God actually come to me and ask me to shave off half of my head and lie on one side for a month in front of my friends in the middle of the road? Read it. Find out what God has said to his people in the prophets. I believe that you will find there is good news in the prophets. Amen.